Welcome to Worship with the Word, presented by the Good Shepherd Church at Baptist Reform Fellowship meeting in East Dallas. Jeff Gregory, pastor. We're glad that you're with us today. We hope that you'll be able to join with us some as we go through the liturgy of worship. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Yahweh sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his great mercy has brought us to life again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. We, by your mercy, will come into your house and in reverence will bow toward your holy temple. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Father, what a privilege it is to gather together before your holy presence, scattered throughout various places, but Lord, one in spirit and one in heart, because we want to give you glory, we want to worship you, we want to feed upon your word, we want to offer to you acceptable praise. Yes. So Lord, this is our prayer. Hear us and be glorified through our service today. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Listen to the great commandment. Listen, Israel. Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is the only God. Love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your strength. Hear the word of God from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Amen. Let us acknowledge our sins before our righteous God. Yahweh is in his holy temple. Yahweh is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. Who, Who can, can discern, discern his errors? errors? Forgive, Forgive my, my hidden, hidden faults. A broken, broken and contrite heart, O God, you, you will, will not despise. despise. Let us confess our transgressions to our covenant Lord. Today we're going to use the lyrics of a hymn, which is a prayer hymn of confession. We have not known thee as we ought, nor learned thy wisdom, grace, and power. The things of earth have filled our thought and trifled to the passing hour. Lord, give us light, thy truth to see, and make us wise in knowing thee. We have not feared thee as we ought, nor bowed beneath thy watchful eye, nor guarded deed and word and thought, remembering that God was nigh. Lord, give us faith to know thee near, and grant the grace of loving fear. We have not served thee as we ought. Alas, the duties left undone. The work with little fervor wrought. The battles lost are scarcely won. Lord, give the zeal and give the might for thee to toil, for thee to fight. We have not loved thee as we ought, 
nor cared that we are loved by thee. Thy presence we have coldly sought and feebly long thy face to see. Lord, give us a pure and loving heart to feel and know the love thou art. Amen. Perhaps you have all of some sins that you would like to name before the Lord at this time. If so, his word tells us to simply name them before him, ask his forgiveness, and the blood of Jesus Christ goes on cleansing us from our sins. Hear the assurance of pardon. To those who turn from sin and seek Jesus Christ, there's no God like our God, for he promises to pardon sin and forgive transgression. He treads our sins underfoot and hurls all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. He is faithful, loving, and true to his promises. Take heart. In Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against him. For God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Believe the gospel. Receive God's forgiveness. Amen. Let us give attention to the reading of the sacred writings. The Apostle Paul writes, Give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. We will be reading from the Old Testament, from the Psalms, and from the New Testament epistle, and from the Gospel. Give attention. From the First Testament, from Genesis chapter 15, verses 5 through 18, God brought him, that's Abraham, brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars, if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed Yahweh, and he counted it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am Yahweh, who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, Lord God, how can I know that I will possess it? He said to him, Bring me a three-year-old cow, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against And he brought them, at all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcass, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. Mm. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your offspring, I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Amen. A reading from Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompass me. The pangs of Sheol lay hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. 
O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now a reading from the New Testament, the first letter of Peter, chapter 1, verses 17 through 23. This will actually be the preaching text for this for today. Peter writes, And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. Amen. Reading from the Gospel of Luke, a resurrection appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ on the day of his resurrection. That very day, two of them, two of his disciples, were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem and does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty indeed, and word before God in all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And Jesus said to them, O foolish one, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he had interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's toward evening, and day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with him gathered together saying, The Lord has risen indeed, has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of 
of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's customary that we often give an offering to the Lord, either a monetary, our time, or other things, and it is part of an act of worship. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. If you would like to make such an offering uh, to do so, you may go to our website and click on online giving and make a contribution for the work of the Lord. Here is some text of a prayer written by Phil Rowland. I worship you, my Lord. I gladly bow the knee. For anything I give you now is what you first gave me. I worship you, my Lord. I gladly bow the knee and give you all the rights to all I am or hope to be. Amen. Amen. Let's give attention to the preaching of the Word of God by Pastor Jeff Gregory, the minister of the Word at Good Shepherd Church. Amen. If you have your Bible, please turn to First Epistle of Peter. First Peter. First Peter chapter one. I'm reading from the ESV translation. We've already read this passage just a few minutes ago, so I'm not going to read the whole passage, but I do want to read the, the two verses that I'll be really focusing on this evening. That's uh, chapter 1 of 1 Peter, verses 20 and 21. The scripture says, He was foreknown, that is Jesus, before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we now come before your word. We acknowledge the authority of your word, the truth of your word, and Lord, we also acknowledge that the Holy Spirit inspired this word, and the Holy Spirit must open it up to us and reveal its truth and work its great power within our hearts and minds. So we pray that you would do that today through the reading and the teaching of your word. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Do you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead after being dead for three days. Amen. Whether you believe this or not determines your eternal destiny. Mm. Christianity is in reality a resurrection faith. The entire structure of Christianity is built on the foundation of Christ's resurrection from the dead. In our passage today, I want us to look at the truths that are laid out before us. These two verses, verses 20 and 21 of 1 Peter 1. And here's what I see as the main idea of these two verses. And this is it. For our sake, God glorified his Son by raising him from the dead, so that our faith and hope are in God. Let's look at verse 20 to begin with. It says, For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. The scripture says here that he was foreknown from before the foundation of the, of the world. The, the great truth that we see here is that God's plan before creation was to send his son for our sake. And this was before the foundation of the world. He, he foreknew his people. That means he he looked upon them with love. We see a parallel scripture to this truth in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, where the Apostle Paul writes and says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him 
before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So we see this, this same idea before the foundation of the world. Now, the scripture says here in verse 20 that he was made manifest in the last time. It says, for your sake. Now, this phrase, for your sake, is important, and we can't just skip over it. What does it mean? What are its implications? Well, let's think about another text or two. The book of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. The apostle is writing to the church at Ephesus, mostly who are apparently Gentile people. They're not Jews. And he describes their situation before the gospel came to them. And he says in Ephesians 2, verse 12, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So Jesus was made manifest for your sake, for these unbelieving pagans. And they had no hope. The scripture says they were without God. But now in Christ Jesus, they were brought near by his blood. Well, some have been brought near. How have they been brought near? Well, Colossians 1, verses 26 and 27 says, here again the apostles writing Paul, and he says, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So you see, Salvation in Christ was something that was hidden in the plan of God, but in the fullness of time it was revealed through the coming of Christ and uh, revealed to the world, the one mediator between man and God. Well, what does this mean for those of us who believe in Christ? What it means is that God spared no effort to redeem his people. The Son of God, the second person of the triune God, left heaven, clothed himself fully with our humanity, and suffered a criminal's death on a cross. He died in our place. He suffered and carried our sins. So God spared no effort to redeem his people. And it says here Christ died, what? For the sake of, for the benefit of those Christians to whom Peter was writing. You see, there's particularity in Christ's redemption for his people. He actually would have been perfectly just and righteous to let the whole world, the whole human race, perish in their sins. But he's not only just and righteous, but God is merciful. And he grants salvation to those who desperately need it, but don't deserve it. Now, to whom does God grant salvation? Peter writes to the Gentile churches in Asia Minor, for your sake, for your sake, you people, Christ came and died. And so this, this aspect of, of focus, Christ's redemptive work was focused in particular on a certain group of people upon whom he had mercy. Now, <clears throat> the scriptures reveal this quite plainly in other places. Let me just mention a couple of them. Matthew 25, verse 31 when the Son of Man comes in glory, says Jesus, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne, and before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd sh separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. So we can see clearly there that humanity is divided into two groups of people. The sheep, which are those whom uh, Jesus has called to himself, and the goats, those refuse, who refuse to hear or respond to the gospel. Uh, in John chapter 17, verse 9, in the great high priestly prayer, prayer of Jesus, Jesus says to his disciples, or about his disciples, he says, I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. So he's praying to his father He's praying not for the whole world, but for his disciples. 
Professor Gordon Clark says this, Christ was not manifested to or for everyone indiscriminately, but his saving benefits are limited to the faithful elect. Now we cannot get around this phrase in verse 20 where Paul says, uh, Peter says, Christ was sent for your sake. Peter, who's he writing to? Who's he speaking to? Well, he's writing to some particular churches in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey, and he's not writing to everyone in those cities, but he's writing only to those who, who were formerly pagans but had come to faith in Christ and had gathered together in local churches. You see, this electing call of God to a particular group of people is revealed in Scripture, and it should cause one of two reactions in us when we hear it. The first reaction is humility and gratitude and joy in the lives of those who've been called to belong to Jesus. And the second reaction that it should bring forth in others is repentance from their sin and calling upon God for salvation to those who are not Christians. Romans 10, 13 issues the invitation, rather the command, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So the promise of God is there. If you want to be saved, if you want to have your sins forgiven, if you want to have eternal life, call upon God to save you. Call upon the Lord. And this is not an option. It is a command from God Almighty. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you're not a Christian, you must cry out, to God to save you. But for those who have been so blessed by the grace and mercy of God and have come in faith to Christ, what does that mean for, for us? It means that, that we are loved by God from before the foundation of the world and that we are crucially important to God because the second person of the triune God left heaven, clothed himself with our human nature suffered and, and, and died for us on the cross, bearing our sins, bearing the wrath against our sins. And so finally, it means that our lives are not our own because we've been bought with a price, with the precious blood of Christ. So our lives need to be lived before the presence of God, seeking to do his will. Well, the scripture says here in verse 21, who, speaking to these Christians in Asia Minor, who through him are believers in God. You see, a second major point I want to make on these two verses is that through Christ, we are believers in God. Let's look at another couple of texts which point out this truth. For example, in John chapter 12, verse 44, Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. You see, there is this link between the Father and the Son. To believe in the Son is to believe also in the Father. And to see the Son is also to see the Father. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Yeah. So how do we have peace with God? The text says here that it's only through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not by our own good deeds or by our adherence to any other religion or philosophy, but it's only through Christ. Well, the scriptures reveal that belief in God or belief in a God that is not squarely and totally focused on Jesus Christ is a deficient, distorted, and false belief. What does verse 20 says? say? It says that 
he, that is Christ, was foreordained before the foundation of the world and then revealed in these last times. How was he revealed? He was revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Only through Jesus' death and resurrection can sin be paid for, can sinners be redeemed from their sin. This was a historical event, and the actuality of what happened was recorded by reliable observers, and their witness was written down under the guidance of the Holy Spirit so that all humanity can now read what God did in history to rescue a people for himself. Historically, as we look in the Old Testament, we see that God revealed himself to, Adam, or to Abraham, who became the father of the Hebrew nation. And through the Hebrews, God revealed his plan to send a divine savior. He did this through no other people, no other tribe, no other culture, no other nation on earth. Jesus Christ himself came from a town in the north of Galilee called Nazareth. And he fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament prophets, the Hebrew prophets, that God would send a kingly Messiah, an anointed one, anointed by the Spirit to the world through one of the descendants, through a descendant of King David. And Jesus was such a descendant. He was a direct descendant of King David. So this is the way that the eternal God who created the heavens and the earth chose to bring salvation to the world. This is the way God chose to act. His ways are much greater than our ways. He's much wiser than we are. Isaiah 55, 8 says, this is Yahweh God speaking, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Now, the apostle Peter who wrote this letter that we're studying, declared this about Jesus in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 12. He says, There's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's no other name given by which humans can be saved. Jesus was born a Jew in Bethlehem of Judea, which is outside Jerusalem. My own ancestors came from Northern Europe, from England, Scotland. Centuries ago, they were no doubt pagan worshipers of idols, false gods. And had I followed in their steps, I too would have spent my life in vanities, doing the same thing, pursuing idols of materialism or popularity or, or pleasure. But God had mercy on me, this poor sinner, and he enabled me to hear the good news of Jesus Christ, to believe on him, to turn from my sinful and selfish lifestyle and turn my life over to him to be used for his purpose. No other God in the history of the world, no other religion, no other philosophy could have done that for this poor sinner. None of them would have done me or anyone else any spiritual good. These other religions have a show of godliness, but they lack the holiness and the truth and the power and the righteousness of Jesus, the Son of God, who is no less than true God from true God, light from light, who came down from heaven to save a people out of every nation and tongue and tribe, this includes you who are listening today, if you will come to him. He died to save his people all through the centuries. And he did this through no other religion that's practiced on the face of the earth. Or he did it through no other religious founder. You see, God has the right to choose how he will save people from their sins. And he determined from before the foundation of the world that he would send his son and save his own people through Christ. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Have you believed in what God has done? You must believe. You must turn from your sins if you would be saved and receive the gift of eternal life. No person is beyond the reach of the living God. 
He waits to save you. Do not delay. Run into his arms and you will find a safe place, a secure place for the rest of your life and into eternity future. The scripture says in Romans 10 and 9, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And then again, chapter 13 of Romans 10 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Call on him today to save you. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He has done wondrous things in sending a Redeemer to the peoples of the earth. Do not despise or brush aside what God has done in Christ. You have everything to gain and nothing to lose by coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look again at verse 21. The scripture says, who raised him from the dead, that is, God raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. The third point that I want to make here is this, that because Christ was raised from the dead, our faith and hope are in God. Two things I want to establish here as we move along. The first thing is that the scripture says, that God raised his son from the dead. Now the resurrection of a dead person is no small thing. Humanly speaking, it is impossible. Once the heart stops and the brain shuts down, death sweeps over the human body and leaves a cold, dead corpse. Can such a corpse live again? No, it cannot. It's scientifically impossible. There is a point of no return when the dead person cannot be brought back to life. The internal organs cease to function, and they cannot be revived. I remember, for example, <clears throat> once I was hiking in the mountains of Colorado, and I accidentally dropped my camera off a cliff onto the rocks far below. And that was the end of that camera. It lay somewhere far below, shattered into many pieces, irretrievable. So it is when death strikes a human. And resurrection never happens. No one ever comes back from the dead. In the whole history of the world, it never happened. A dead person was never brought back to life who had been stone cold, cold dead for several days, except one time. One time it did happen. And that was when the eternal, almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, raised his son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. In the four gospel records in the New Testament, there are no less than ten accounts of the physically resurrected Jesus Christ appearing to his disciples, where he taught them, was touched by them, he ate with them, and he even cooked a meal for them. <clears throat> All these men were people of the highest integrity and rationality. And they wrote down from the historical record what they saw and heard and experienced. John, the closest apostle and best friend of Jesus, wrote this in 1 John 1, 1, and 3, 1 through 3. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, we have looked upon and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was manifest, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. John had been with the Lord Jesus, seen him, heard him, touched him. He was proclaiming the truth of the incarnation and the resurrected Son of God <clears throat> to those to whom he was writing. So I want you to know this, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead three days after he was crucified, killed, and buried. He appeared to his disciples. After 40 days, he went back to heaven. And he was crowned with glory and honor at the right hand of God the Father. And he rules over all things in heaven and earth, even over the world with the coronavirus pandemic. The Church of Jesus Christ for the last 20 centuries has served and worshipped a living Savior. He is not a dead Savior. He's alive and well and governing his church and all the affairs of the world. 
All that we have, every breath that we breathe is in his hands. Evil and sickness and death seem to be on every hand around us, but Jesus Christ is reigning and working out all things for his own purposes, his own glory, and for the good of his beloved church on earth, the people of God. The scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, that in raising Jesus from the dead, God gave him glory. Death could not hold him down. The sins of his people that had been laid on his back could not destroy him. He, in fact, destroyed them by absorbing God's wrath against those sins and removing their condemnation against his people. Does he not deserve glory for doing this? Who else in the history of the world has done this? No one else. That is why Peter declared in Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no other name. The name of no other God, no other religion can save you or me from our sins. Only Jesus can save us. If you've been saved, you need to thank him from the bottom of your heart and throw yourself into grateful service in his name. Oh, to be saved from our sins. To have eternal life. To have a home in heaven. To have communion and fellowship with the living God. What greater joy can a human know? I like to occasionally read the prayers in the Book of Common Prayer. Yesterday I came across this one, which is for the Saturday of Easter week. And the prayer goes like this. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have delivered us from the dominion of sin and death and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. And we pray that as by his death he has recalled us to life, so by his love may he raise us to eternal joys. There you have it. In some reform, the blessings of the gospel. By his death... He recalled us to life, and by his life, he raises us to eternal joy. Oh, just to be in the presence of our God and Savior. What else really matters in this life? All else is fading away and will soon be gone. Only what belongs to Christ and his kingdom will last forever. All the more reason, dear friend, not to hesitate. If you don't know Christ, run to him now and be saved. Maybe the distress on the earth at this time, the, the pandemic among the nations is, is a sign of his soon coming. So we must be ready for his return by turning away from our sins, accepting Jesus as our Savior and Lord. Well, let's now turn to the last phrase of verse 21. It reads, so that your faith and hope are in God. What is it that gives us faith and hope in God? Well, look at the first part of the sentence. It says, who, that is God, who raised him, that is Jesus, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. It is Christ's resurrection and glorification that gives us faith and hope. Now, what kind of faith is Peter talking about? It is not faith that scientists will find a vaccine for the COVID-19 disease. It's not faith that the economy will recover. It's not faith in any man or human organization or government but it's faith in God Almighty. And it's not faith in just any so-called God. As the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 5, he says, For although there may be, there may be so-called gods in heaven and earth, as indeed there are many gods, quotation marks, and many lords, quotation marks, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. Yes, there are many claims of false gods, and false religions, and false cults, and, and merely human philosophies that are floating everywhere in our culture and around the world, but as the text says, in reality, there's only one God, the Father, who created all things and for whose purpose we exist. And there's only one Lord, Jesus Christ. It is through him that all things came into being and through whom 
through him we exist. So this is God as he reveals himself. This is not man's conception of God. This is what God has revealed about himself. It is amazing, is it not? It's not easy to completely grasp or understand the infinite, eternal God. But God has kindly and mercifully chosen to reveal something of his nature and his eternal being to us. And this statement here in, uh, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 8, is not a complete statement, a description of the being of God, but it does show us the unity of the Father and the Son, the creators of all that is, and the fact that we exist not for ourselves, but for God and for his glory. Does this truth humble you? Well, it should. Me too. Does it offend you? It is indeed offensive to human pride. Do you find it hard to understand the being of God? If you do, you're not alone. But we do get a vision of the power and the glory and the beauty of God, of he who is someone far beyond ourselves, someone who's greater than we are, and we have been privileged to be drawn in and to learn of his nature. And now that kind of realization of the nature of God can, can change our lives. The knowledge of God, of his infinite holiness and majesty and love, there is no end. There is no plummeting the depths of the greatness of God. This is the one who sent his, his eternal son to die and to rise in behalf of his people out of every nation, tribe, and tongue. This is the one who the Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter here is telling us about. And he is the basis, he is the foundation of our faith and our hope. And our faith and hope is no vain hope. It's not based on legend or myth, but on historical fact. The historical existence of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, are verified by more historical manuscripts and documents than any other person or event in the history of the world. Christians have a very firm belief and hope based on historical verification alone. God himself, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is the one in whom we place our faith. He is not some kind of nebulous, ill-defined deity made up by the imaginations of men, a God who is little different from humans in his morality and his mischievousness, but he is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He and Christ are one. To see the Son is to know what the Father is like, and to hear the Son is to hear the word of the Father. To see the obedience of the Son is to behold his submission. To see the piety of the Son is to see the holiness of the Father, and to hear the knowledge of the scriptures of the Son is to confirm, confirm his faithfulness to the revealed truth of the Father. Do you see why true religion is bound up totally in the Lord Jesus Christ? There's no truth regarding religious matters, regarding life and death, regarding time and eternity, regarding sin and judgment. There's no truth found in other religions that do not, that do not revolve around Jesus and all that he did and all that he revealed regarding the nature of God. Can these other faiths, can they offer a resurrected Savior? Since Jesus was God in the flesh, every word that he spoke, every action he took, his attitude toward people, whether it was love and compassion or anger at their sin and hypocrisy, all these things were a revelation of the eternal God. It is fruitless. It is useless to believe in any other God found among the religions of men, among all the humans born on this earth. Only one has gone through death and conquered it and rose triumphant forevermore. Therefore, we need to listen to him. We need to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what God, the creator of heaven and earth, has done in sending his son. He secured an everlasting salvation for his people and confirm this by raising Christ from the dead. Everything depends on Christ's resurrection. If he did not rise, 
Christianity can just take its place on the shelf of world religions and just as well be ignored as we go merrily about our life in this world. But the truth of the matter is that Christ did rise, and this changes everything. This means that Jesus really is the Son of God. It means that all he said and taught is true. It means that whatever he said will happen in the future. Whatever he said will happen in the future will certainly come to pass. He said that he's returning to earth at the end of this age to wrap up this chapter of human history. And then he will usher in his eternal kingdom. Because he rose from the dead, we know his word is true. It will happen just as he said. God raised his son from the dead. This is the great fact of history. We know who God the Father is because the Son has revealed him. We look at the Son, we learn of the Father. This is the God in whom we place our faith. Do you see that if your faith is placed in the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that your faith is pl placed in reality, it is placed in something that really happened in somebody that really lived, it is placed in Jesus who rose from the dead. God raised his son, and therefore we can place our faith in God, our heavenly father. He did not fail his son on the cross, but he raised him up from the dead, and he will not fail us either. He will be with us all the days of our earthly pilgrimage, and he will deliver us safely to his heavenly kingdom. As he raised Christ from the dead, he will raise us from the dead also at Christ's return. Because of what Christ, because of what God has done in Christ Jesus, we believe in him, we put our faith in him, he's truly our God. Someone's God is the one whom they serve as their king, their commander-in-chief, the, the one they worship and obey. Their loyalty to their God must be unswerving, un, unwavering. Not to take God seriously by obeying him makes it questionable whether he's really a person's God or not. Now, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ demands, requires commitment. He doesn't expect us to be perfect, but he does require commitment and devotion. God has done great things in Christ, and we trust in him. We trust in him. Our faith is in him. No matter what trials or difficulties come up in our lives, and because of the kind of God the Heavenly Father is, we have hope. The scripture says that our faith and our hope is based on Christ's resurrection. Not to have hope in life is a terrible thing. Sadly, many people in our world don't have hope. Either in this life, because all of its trials and heartaches, nor do they have any hope about their future existence and the age to come. It's very sad to be a human, and to be devoid, to be emptied of hope, to see no future, no chance of changing, of things getting better. Life can certainly be discouraging, even for the Christian, but there's one thing that the Christian is never robbed of, and that is hope. What is it? Why is it that we have hope, no matter how dark and dreary our circumstances, and the circumstances of the world may be? We have hope. Because when things looked hopeless for the disciples of Jesus Christ, when his body was removed, limp and lifeless from, lifeless from the cross, and then placed in a borrowed tomb and sealed shut, the disciples went into a state of depression. Their beloved rabbi and leader was dead and buried. They even feared for their own safety as they cowered behind locked doors. Then suddenly, Jesus appeared in their midst. He was alive. He talked with them and ate with them. The Lord was alive and their hope was reborn. The scripture says in verse 21, God who raised him from the dead gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So what is the nature of this hope that Peter is talking about? Let's look at a few texts that help, help us get a hold of this concept of hope in the scriptures. Acts 24, 15, the Apostle Paul is speaking, and he's defending himself and his faith in Christ, and he says of his ancestors, the Jewish people, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, 
that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. You see, the traditional hope of the Jews, those who believe the scriptures, was the resurrection of the dead. Paul was only proclaiming in Jesus' resurrection what his people had always believed and had been looking for. So for pious Jews who knew and believed the Old Testament scriptures, the resurrection of the dead was not a strange doctrine. Well, this was their hope, the hope of the Jewish people. In Romans 15, 12, we read the root of Jesse. This is a quote from Isaiah. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. So not only the Jews, but the Gentiles. Here's a prophecy that the coming Messiah would rule the Gentiles, and in him they would put their hope. This great hope was being fulfilled among these particular people, these Gentile people in the churches of Asia Minor that Peter was writing to, for they had come to faith in Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13 says, Waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. What is the hope of the church? The hope of the church is the return of the Lord Jesus in his glory. And then in Romans 5.2, we read, Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, the hope of the church, the thing we look forward to, to seeing, is to being in the presence of the glory of God in the age to come, in the new Jerusalem, where God and the Lamb will sit on the throne. In Romans 15, 13, there's this benediction that the Apostle Paul gives. He says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. You may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So God himself here is called the God of hope. What is our God in the business of doing? He's in the business of building hope in the lives of his people. Ephesians 2.12, the apostle Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus. He says, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, Strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. You see, these people had formerly lived outside of the grace of God. And we see here that having no hope is equivalent to not having God in one's life. So to be without God, to have no saving faith in the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, means to be without hope. Christian hope comes from our personal relationship with God. Only Christians can have biblical hope. Now, one more text here, <clears throat> Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 5. Writing here, um, the Apostle Paul says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So you see there's a connection here between <clears throat> these six basic elements that can be seen as a description of what it means to be a Christian, to be in fellowship and union with other Christians. Every single one of us who have come to Christ and been washed in his blood are members of the one body of Christ. We're all indwelt by the same Holy Spirit. We're all called to one hope, to serve one Lord, to have one common faith in Jesus, the resurrected Son of God. We've all been baptized with that one baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit when we come to faith in Jesus. So to be called to this one hope, here it seems to be, to me, a broad usage of the concept. It could refer to any and all and even more of those various aspects of hope that I pointed out. But this one hope is a basic gift given to all Christians and is fundamental to their relationship with God and with one another. So what is the basis of this hope? Why can we have such hope? The text tells us in 1 Peter 1 21, through him who are believers in God, who, are, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. How are we believers in God? 
It is through Jesus Christ. Our belief in God is completely tied to our faith in Jesus Christ. What is it about Jesus Christ that moves us to believe in him? It's because God raised him from the dead. So both our faith and our Christian hope are anchored to this fact. Our belief in God is anchored to his resurrection from the dead on the third day. His resurrection is the hinge that swings the door on all our Christian faith. It is the historical event, the event confirmed by more than 500 witnesses, the event that showed that Jesus is the promised Messiah of Israel and the Savior of all people everywhere who will come to him and bow before him and confess him as their own Lord and Savior. Why did Peter put so much stress on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead? Well, you may remember that G uh, Peter had spent over three years with Jesus, and he was the leader of the disciples. And although he had denied that he knew Christ during his public trial, on the day in which Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus made a special personal appearance to Peter. And Peter was there on the other occasions when the Lord appeared to the gathered disciples. So Peter saw him, the resurrected Lord, with his own eyes. He touched him with his own hands. He heard him teach the disciples. He ate with the Lord Jesus and the other disciples. He was deeply affected. He was overwhelmed with the reality of Christ's bodily resurrection from the dead. It was his joy. It was his joy to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. He could not keep it secret. He had seen it with his own eyes. I'm sure that he never ceased to be amazed that he himself, this fisherman, from the Lake of Galilee had had the privilege of being in the presence of the resurrected Lord, the promised Messiah of Israel. I can imagine that it was never very far from his mind. It permeated his preaching and teaching. In this very one chapter of 1 Peter, he pointed out on two occasions the power and the effect of the resurrection of Jesus for Christians in verse 3 and 21 in verse 3, Christ's resurrection is the direct basis of our new birth, our being born again spiritually. And then here in verse 21, we've seen how his being raised from death is the direct foundation and inspiration of our Christian faith and our Christian hope. Well, what have we seen today? In these two verses, we have seen that we've seen God's plan before creation to send his son was for our sake for the sake of the church. And secondly, we've seen here that through Christ, through Christ alone, we are believers in God. And thirdly, we have seen that because Christ was raised from the dead, our faith and our hope are in God. Do you have faith in Jesus Christ today? Do you believe in him as the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and your own personal Savior? Without Christ's resurrection, you could not have, you would not have this faith. But because God raised him from the dead, you can have certain faith that he will save you from your sins. And you can have strong hope that he will keep you secure in his love and power and bring you to himself in the last days. Won't you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrected Son of God? In him is safety. In him is joy, and in him is life without end. Let's pray together. Our Father in God, you've done a mighty work in raising your Son from the dead. We're debtors to you for providing us sinners with such a divine rescue. We believe in you. We hope in you. We will never cease to praise you and thank you. In the name of our gracious Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Let us now confess our faith in the words of a scriptural confession of faith. Great indeed, we confess, is the, the mystery, mystery of, of our, our religion. religion. God, God was, was made, made visible in human in flesh was vindicated in the spirit, beheld by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. 
God has made this Jesus, whom men crucified, both Lord and Christ. And we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. Amen. Let us give God our prayers. You might want to take some time after listening to this service and sermon to present your own requests before God. But here are two prayers for this Lord's Day. A collect for the third Sunday of Easter. O oh God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith, that we may behold him in all of his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Father, we give you thanks for giving us your holy word and for setting before us the living hope of our resurrection with Christ and the sure inheritance of life with him and of all the redeemed at the end of this current order and at the establishment of the new heavens and the new earth at our Lord's return. We rejoice and expectantly wait in union with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Ordinarily, when we gather together, we have the Lord's Supper, but we're not able to do that at this point. But we long for the time when we can gather again and share the bread and wine as Christ commanded. This do in remembrance of me, he said. Of the bread, he said, this is my body given for you. Of the wine, he said, this cup is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of the sins of many. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Please receive the benediction of the Lord. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.